Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Simon Rattle. Uh, we're going to have a chat about various uh, aspects of Baroque music. When I was starting out with my Baroque group, in, uh, uh, incidentally led by Monica Huggett, um, I sort of handed over and I said, oh, we're going to do Brandenburg something or, or, or a Handel Concerto Grosso and you just play it. This is the way it's got to be. And I was incredibly sort of overawed by their uh, knowledge, their already their experience and their opinions about how things should go. And I always, in those days, took a back seat. I was, I was sort of a lazy conductor. I stood, sat there at the harpsichord and they would, Monica would say, oh, no, you have to do it this way. And, and you know, and, and then Ali would say, no, no, it's got to be that way. And I said, look, yeah, let's just do it. And things, it then became quite a different experience because I then went back to the modern instruments and they'd, they'd, they'd play as they always did, you know, sort of long bows and lots of vibrato. And I said, but, but you couldn't put up with it anymore. No, you couldn't. That's the point. And then I then had to take, take the reins and be very uh, adamant about how I wanted to hear it. And, you know, in those days you were talking about, please, please don't vibrate so much and don't, um, you know, let's have a bit of articulation. Just break up the phrases a little bit so it isn't so smooth. And and they say, oh, right. And then in the end, in order not to talk too much, you had to put it into the parts. And it used to, I used to use the same parts with the modern instruments and with uh, Raglan Baroque players. And it drove the um, period instrument players completely up the wall because they saw they saw things that they do anyway you know little commas and yes of know. course but but you remember because i have the same thing many of these pieces have been through my whole life and mm. you look at the pieces i've done for the longest time and it's like a history of mm. the problems we yes. had yes but yes of course what was very funny when i first went to the uh, the age of enlightenment uh although it was mostly all British players, uh, there was a group that played uh, in Holland with Franz Bruchen, and there was a group that played in Holland with Tom Koopman. Yeah. Uh, and what was fascinating for me is, of course, Franz Bruchen talked only about the Minuendo, uh, <laughs> and Tom Koopman talked only about Crescendo. So I knew that basically, any phrase there would be World War Nine uh, <laughs> within the Age of Enlightenment because nobody, they were all from such very, very different, uh, different schools that we actually had to decide, well, what does it mean? And I, I found that, that fight actually very inspiring, if desperately time consuming and you know, not terribly professional. Yeah. I mean, I worry sometimes that period instrument orchestras have become almost too professional, mm. that there is, there is a way they do things. Yeah. Uh, and, which is why, for instance, as you say, the Australian Chamber Orchestra now, I find one of the most I inspiring orchestras in the world Absolutely. because they have a complete, it's not an agenda, but they have an idea mm. of wh which they believe so strongly that you can't help be swept along by it. And, and the leader then, as he is now, Richard Tonietti, he had some of the most natural Baroque um, ideas and sound in his head that I ever heard, including Baroque violinists. So, I mean, this was a long, long time ago. Um, I'll never forget him playing a Vivaldi concerto. And I thought, wow, I mean, this is, this is just completely influenced me about how I wanted to hear a Vivaldi concerto being played. It was so full of fantasy, absolutely wonderful, just, in, you know, incredible that, in that way. I'm going to... Isn't it fascinating what people feel is natural? Yes. Because of course, as conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic, I did 16 years of string auditions and particularly violin auditions. Mm. And if there was anybody who ever came and played a little bit of Bach 
or a little bit of Mozart in the way that I thought it should sound, they were immediately thrown out. I was like, well, that's just grotesque. You can't have people playing music like this here. I don't know, this is fascinating because there are, uh, there is such a wide church of what people, how people believe yeah. music should go. Yeah. But even the Berlin Philharmonic has moved actually very far in this direction. Yeah. And Bill Christie has come, you have come, Emmanuel Haim has, yeah. uh, has come, Giovanni Antonini, Tom Copeman, you name it. And so actually now they have really, they have this more in mind. Absolutely. I mean, it was like w w when I worked with them, it was it was just like the most expert Baroque orchestra you could possibly have. But but w sort of w without the I don't know what, it, you know, they had to be they still had to be told. They still had to be led in a way. And it was quite early on in the journey for them as well. Which brings me very neatly on to one of your predecessors in Berlin. I gather you had a very interesting phone conversation with him. Um, oh my God, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, do, I don't suppose there are many people who can have had the honor to have had the phone slammed down on them by Herbert von Karajan. But <laughs> I at least, thank goodness, I knew he was going to make a telephone call. I had been warned in advance, but I was in Birmingham in my apartment. And he, he was, we had already met uh, in Berlin and he'd actually been incredibly charm, well, charming like an old soldier. Like, we, I, I'm sure if you'd met General Patton, it would have been like that. Yeah. Uh, gruff, but actually very warm in, in this way. But he rang up and asked me this astonishing thing. He said, look, I am now physically no longer able really to conduct opera. Uh, although it's been the most important thing in my life. I, I am doing Figaro next year in uh, the Salzburg Easter Festival and the Summer Festival. Easter with the Berlin Philharmonic, summer the same production with the Vienna Philharmonic, as it always was in those days. Would you like to take it over? And I explained to him, I, I was very flattered, but I explained to him why I couldn't, because... In fact, I already had uh, other things to do. I, in fact, I was doing uh, already Mozart operas at Gleinborn. And he said, well, you know, what are you doing and how are you doing them? Uh, and I, for some idiotic reason, I thought it was a good idea to tell him that I was playing Mozart with period instruments uh, and that I was worried that you know, if I'd done that, I would, it would be really hard to get what I had in mind out of uh, even these great orchestras. And, what, and there was a, an explosion and a number of languages came out of it, part of which was English. And what I can remember is, well, I don't know what kind of style you think you're playing in, but I'm just playing Mozart style, goodbye. And the <laughs> phone went down. <laughs> Why did I think that this was uh, a good moment to tell him that? Also, because I, I, you know, I know what the problems he had. I mean, for instance, he had, absolutely refused to allow Harnan Corps to conduct either in Berlin uh, or in or in Salzburg. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, but I, at least re afterwards, I got a friendly message which, uh, which said, look, I, st I still think you're completely out of your mind to be playing with those ridiculous instruments, but I really do wish you well. <laughs> uh, but there, there we go. Yes, right. But of course, look, this was the master of legato and the legato culture. Mm. And the idea that you might put uh, consonants into your sentence as well as vowels was completely foreign to him in so much, in so much music. And when I went to do, for instance, the Haydn, the creation in Berlin, which we did an enormous amount, and the principal bass said, Simon, you have no idea how extraordinary this is for us, because we did this with Carrion, and we always played this with nine basses. It was always the full orchestra. And now we're playing, oh no, there's me and two others, and it feels like completely different music. Yes, absolutely. Well, let's move on.
to Berlin uh, as it was, as it became under your direction. Um, and here's something that maybe you don't do a great deal of even now, and that is uh, the music of Henry Purcell. Um, so we're going to hear, I mean, how did this come about? Just tell us. This came about, I mean, first of all, because I've always loved this, this extraordinary music. It came about as a programmatic thing because this was the, the, the two years running where Mahler had his two anniversaries. And so we did over two years a Mahler cycle, which wasn't terribly original, but as everybody else was doing it, of course. Yeah. But I felt we should do pieces which related to it or told the same story or had. So, uh, I mean, for instance, we did before the eighth symphony uh, was the, the Talis 40 part motet. Uh, and before the fifth symphony, before the funeral march with the trumpet, da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da, it did occur to me that the Purcell funeral music, I mean, all of it, not only the brass music, but with the, with the chorus as well, was an extraordinary way to move into that world. And so I got a chance to play this amazing piece. Well, let's hear it. it this is uh, maybe Herbert von Karajan was turning in his grave when you were recording this, but... Um, I was hoping that sound was drums, but you might be right. Yeah. <laughs> so let's hear a little bit of this uh, Purcell funeral music. So that was um, Purcell's funeral music for Queen Mary, played by the Berlin Philharmonic, conducted by Simon Rattle. So we now move on to, um, well, we've really talked about what the problems are 
and what the delights are of performing Baroque music on modern instruments. Um, since we both done both, in other words, we both perform music on 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 all sorts of instruments, and um, in the end, for me, I didn't feel that uh, that I was one was any better than the other. Um, I had more experience with. It modern. is what people what people have in their brains. And I had an interesting thing from the other direction. When, when I came to America with the CBSO and mm. we played the Boreard Suite in New York, mm. uh, in my family at the time uh, was Luther Henderson, who uh, was a great jazz musician and orchestrator and was the orchestrator of uh, Ellington's big pieces like Harlem. They're all... They were all Luther's job. Mm. Uh, and we had the idea that we would try and record Ellington with a lot of great jazz soloists, but with a symphony orchestra and mm. make this mixture. And when Luther came to hear us play Rameau, he said, oh, look, if your orchestra can swing like that, this idea of uh, notes in egal, he said, this is, this da ba da ba da ba da. This uh, not triplet feeling, but this unequal. This is exactly what you need for mm. Ellington. So I've heard you play this. You're going to have no problem with Ellington. Mm. And in fact, and of course, and he said, of course, our music came from the French. It came from the Creoles, and it came from this language. Yeah. Uh, the, the whole swing of it. But I thought this is interesting, the, kind of the other way around. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Isn't that interesting? And um, talking of America, of course, I, um, funnily enough, I had my first experience with an American orchestra the day after you conducted the largest orchestra in the world. I went, I came over in, and it was in 1998, I came over and conducted the Milwaukee Orchestra, Symphony Orchestra, in, an, in a program of Baroque music, which I'd taken over from someone who'd canceled. And, um, and I thought, oh, here I am in America. I'd never conducted an American orchestra before. And three years later, I came uh, and did an audition for Music of the Baroque. And here we are, still there. And, um, of course, I, I covered a huge repertoire with 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 this wonderful group, um, and but the, and of course, what people in Europe don't realize is how unusual it was to have a group in America like this at that time. I mean, it's only now that early music is even on the curriculum of the Juilliard School, for instance. I mean, this music of the Baroque is really a groundbreaker there. Yeah. I mean, it's it's in its fiftieth anniversary year. So, I mean, that is really something. And I mean, okay, the styles of, uh, of playing has changed hugely over the years, but the repertoire that the uh, founder, Tom Whitman, um, explored was completely unknown. Funnily enough, I, th I, I think I'm not wrong in uh, the Music of the Baroque did the first American performance of Idomeneo as it happens. Um, I know. Uh, anyway, uh, the Brandenburgs have become a core part of the music of the Baroque repertoire, and I never, ever get sick of them. And I'm going to uh, pick one that um, maybe would be the, the sort of Cinderella of the, of the Brandenburgs, which is number six. And it's, it's a very unusual one because it it doesn't really have instruments that you would ever want to hear on their own, uh, or you might not, you know, you wouldn't have had the experience of hearing them on their own. So two violas, two viol da gamba, um, cello, double bass and harpsichord. And it's- I'm gonna have a me too moment for violas soon. Yeah. I really do <laughs> hope so. I thought they've been so unfairly maligned. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> And our, our mutual friend, Roger Chase, is play, playing the first viola. Um, uh, when he was had a wonderful time uh, 
with our with our band. He's no longer there there anymore, and and Liz plays the second. And um, it's a very very joyous and uh, it, certainly the best performance of Brandenburg Six, and I've I've done and uh, and I've done a few. So here it is, the last movement of Brandenburg Concerto Number Six. Thank you. 